when I was uh, asked to join the, the committee, um, it uh, actually, a new word was is discovered to me, and it was really interesting. I have to admit, I knew only the basic things about Newton, and I didn't know all of that. But going uh, through um, movies and uh, articles and some history, it was really fascinating. And um, uh, Professor Yakovov, you, you talked about multidisciplinary. So uh, full disclosure, I'm the head of the multidisciplinary department, the new one that we have in Hulon. And I think this whole conference is really with in sync with the idea that scientists and uh, philosophers and uh, people of all um, disciplines can really be interested in the same things, and I, th I think we see that in the audience. Uh, the, first, the first speaker, Professor uh, Stefan Snobelen, um, I'm really impressed that we managed to bring him here. Uh, he's an historian of uh, science and uh, in the history of science and technology and, and theology program of the University of King's College, Halifax, in Nova Scotia, Canada. He received his PhD in history and philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge. His current research focuses on the relationship between Isaac Newton's science and religion. He has published over 30 essays on Newton. Uh, early Modern Theology and the History of Science. He is on the editorial board of the Oxford University in the Newton Project and is director of the Newton Project in Canada. Uh, Dr. Snow uh, Professor Snobelen, uh, the primary research efforts are currently devoted to interpreting Isaac Newton's theology theological manuscripts and understanding the relationship between Newton and science and his religion. And I invite you, uh, sir, to open your lecture. Good morning. I just had to step out to find out what I was speaking about. <laughs> so I have a program here. Um, one of my colleagues uh, said a number of years ago to me that he, he figured I could uh, speak about Newton in my sleep um, I don't think I'm fully awake yet, so we'll, we'll see if we can test that um, <laughs> hypothesis. So what I want to do uh, in, a, in about 30 minutes or so, we'll allow a little bit of time for discussion, is just give you some very brief highlights of our research into the relationship between Newton's science and his religion. I have to say to begin that when we say Newton's science and his religion, we're using those terms, science and religion, uh, somewhat anachronistically and as kind of shortcuts because it's quicker to say that than uh, what historians want to do, which is to qualify what we mean by science and uh, religion. So Newton was not a scientist from our perspective. He was a scientist, but uh, the term scientist was not even coined until the year 1833. Uh, he was a natural philosopher, and this is important because it shows that the field that he's working in, including his physics, uh, still has a kind of relationship with the humanities. It comes out of philosophy in, in the Middle Ages. Um, and similarly, with respect to religion, uh, Newton's uh, understanding of, of God uh, has uh, two uh, kind of facets. Uh, one would be what we often call natural theology, so discovering God and to a certain extent, his attributes in nature. So that would be natural theology, so not using the Bible. Uh, this, uh, for many people in the early modern period, was one of the two books that God wrote. God wrote two books, the book of nature, and the second book, the book of scripture. The book of scripture, of course, is the book of God's words. The book of nature is the book of God's works. And so Newton, like many uh, natural philosophers in the early modern period, believed that God wrote these two books and that because God is not the author of confusion, there should be harmony between those two books. So one source for Newton's uh, theology is nature, the cosmos, which of course we know that he studied. The other source uh, would be the Bible. but. Of course, also commentaries on the Bible. And this, as uh, uh, Dr. Pridor alluded to earlier, uh, 
included the, the Talmud, which he accessed through uh, Christian Hebraists uh, who were publishing in his uh, lifetime. So what I want to do very briefly is do uh, three things. Having outlined what I mean by science and religion is I want to look at some statements that Newton made, and I'll put them up on the screen, about the relationship between the understanding of God and the understanding of nature and the cosmos. And then I'm going to look at some theological elements that are in Newton's Principia Mathematica. So his famous book, the founding book of modern physics, the Principia Mathematica, published in 1687, but then in a second edition in 1713 and a third edition in 1726, all three editions in his lifetime. And then finally, the third thing is I will look at some aspects of the theology of Newton's optics. So this is his second great work, published in English in 1704, and then in Latin in 1706 with some differences, and then a few other editions uh, in his lifetime. Uh, this may seem uh, an odd way to approach this subject because uh, the first edition of the Principia only has one reference to God and one reference to the Bible. Later editions, uh, there is more. The first edition of the Optics has absolutely no references to God, but they come in later editions. So again, this may seem a bit odd, but uh, it's one way of, of gaining some insight into uh, the relationships between uh, Newton's study of God and his study of uh, the cosmos. So uh, this is our theme, science and religion in the thought of Isaac Newton. And this is our first of three topics. Newton's statements on God and natural philosophy. And what we're going to see is that Newton seems to be arguing that there should be some distinctions between our study of God and our, our study of uh, nature. And what I'm going to argue is that although he sets out these distinctions, in practice, he doesn't always uh, allow for those distinctions. Okay, so here's the first one. And I'm, I'm looking at these more or less in a chronological order. Some of the manuscripts we don't have precise dates on, but uh, rough dates. Uh, so in a manuscript uh, that relates to his uh, Principia, he wrote, it is philosophic to set forth by what laws and in what way the system of things once set by God is conserved and preserved, preser perseveres. But how this most wise order of things could have arisen from the counsel and will of its founder, natural philosophy does not teach. So what he seems to be saying here is that uh, we can understand God's laws by looking at nature, but to go beyond that uh, is uh, not in the, uh, the province of uh, natural philosophy. Uh, now, in, in a, uh, a statement uh, from the uh, conclusion of the final query of his optics, uh, he writes this, in this third book of optics, I have only begun the analysis of what remains to be discovered about light and its effects upon the frame of nature, hinting several things about it and leaving the hints to be examined and approved by the farther experiments and observations of such as are inquisitive. And if natural philosophy in all its parts, by pursuing this method, shall at length be perfected, the bounds of moral philosophy will also be enlarged. For so far as we know by natural philosophy what is the first cause, what power he has over us, and what benefits we receive from him, so far our duty towards him as well as that towards one another will appear to us by the light of nature. So what does he mean when he speaks about our duty towards God and our duty towards, our duty towards one another? Are you picking this up? Uh, he's referring to uh, what in the New Testament uh, are referred to as the two greatest commandments. And Newton believed that these summarize uh, the Ten Commandments in the Pentateuch. Uh, you love God as your, uh, you love God with all your heart and soul and might, and you love your neighbor as yourself. So what he's saying is that uh, this is something that actually should be related to natural philosophy. 
There should be a moral element to natural philosophy, what we now call science. And this would involve uh, loving God and the ethical dimension, loving our neighbor as ourself. Uh, now here in a, a manuscript from uh, the early 1690s, uh, Newton's study of the original religion, he says something very interesting. He says, it was one design of the first institution of the true religion to propose to mankind by the frame of ancient temples the study of the frame of the world as the true temple of the great God they worship. And thence it was that the priests, and he's talking about the Babylonian Magi, who were priests and astronomers. The same person did both. And thence it was that the priests anciently were above other men skilled in the knowledge of the true frame of nature and accounted it a great part of their theology. So here he seems to be saying that the study of nature is a, should be a part of uh, theology. So that's interesting. Now, this is descriptive. He's describing what he thinks the ancient Babylonian Magi uh, were doing, but I think it's also prescriptive. He is arguing that this is the way uh, natural philosophy or, or science uh, should uh, be formulated. Now, in, in a, a manuscript draft preface of the optics, which he does not publish, but he considers publishing, he wrote this. One principle in philosophy, and this would include natural philosophy, science, is the being of a god or spirit, infinite, eternal, omniscient, omnipotent, and the best argument for such a being is the frame of nature, the structure of nature, and chiefly the contrivance of the bodies of living creatures. He was very interested in the structure of living creatures and their bilateral symmetry. These and such like considerations are the most convincing arguments for such a being, God, and have convinced mankind in all ages that the world and all the species of things therein were originally framed by his power and wisdom. And to lay aside this argument is unphilosophical and somewhat anachronistically we could translate that as unscientific. Now he doesn't publish this, but uh, we believe that he, uh, he thought this to be true. Uh, now here's another statement. This one comes from around 1715. He says, uh, one principle of religion is that religion and philosophy, or we could say religion and science are to be preserved as things. So this is what I was referring to earlier. Sometimes he seems to be saying this. Uh, this is very similar to the argument of Galileo in his letter to Christina, uh, where he says that, uh, quoting Cardinal Baronius, that the Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. So the Bible is a theological text. It's a spiritual text. It doesn't tell us about the structure of the cosmos. Uh, we go to the Bible for spiritual things. So Newton seems to have loosely uh, adhered to that uh, thinking. We are not to introduce divine revelations into philosophy, nor philosophical opinions into religion. Now, divine revelations, that of course would refer uh, to uh, the Bible. Now, here from a draft pre preface of the Principia, wasn't published, but he thought about publishing it, he wrote this. What is taught in metaphysics, if it is derived from divine revelation, is religion. If it is derived from phenomena through the five external senses, it pertains to physics. If it is derived from knowledge of the internal actions of our mind through the sense of reflection, it is only philosophy about the human mind and its ideas as internal phenomena likewise pertain to physics. So again, we see this suggestion that there should be some distinctions between uh, natural philosophy and theology. But here's another example. Uh, this, again, uh, was not published. It's from his private manuscripts, uh, where uh, in Latin he says, nam deus ex operibus cognoscitor, for God is known from his works. And what we're seeing here is the idea that if we use the method of induction, we can induce or infer the existence of God and probably also to a certain extent some of his attributes and characteristics from his works, that is to say his creation, uh, the cosmos. So one of the things we're seeing here is that Newton seems to have believed that uh, the separation between science and religion applies specifically to doctrine, to the scripture, to the interpretation of scripture, but it does not apply to natural 
uh, theology. Uh, natural theology could be allied with uh, natural philosophy, that is to say, science. Here's another one. In English, the translation is, when engaging in philosophy, religion is to be avoided, and when engaging in religion, philosophy is to be avoided. I think one of the backdrops to this is that in England in the 17th century into the early 18th century, there were a lot of conflicts between different versions of uh, Protestantism and the thought of the members of the Royal Society of London, of which Newton was president at this point, uh, was that if we have uh, discussions about sectarian differences in uh, our natural philosophy, then there's going to be a lot of uh, disruption and, and uh, animosity. We want to avoid that. But this does not mean that they were not religious. Uh, so they all agreed in the existence of God, almost all of them, uh, and natural uh, theology, but they didn't want to bring in questions about Anglicanism and Presbyterianism and things like that. So I think that's part of what's going on there. Uh, here's an, another uh, statement that Newton uh, actually uses when he signs his name in at least three autograph books of young scholars from uh, the continent. Uh, and it's from uh, what uh, Protestants call the Apocrypha, so not part of the, not part of the Tanakh, not part of what Christians call the Old Testament, uh, but other books, uh, Jewish writings, and this is the wisdom of Solomon 11, uh, verse 20. God has established all things by number, weight, and measure. Newton, like many others in the early modern period, was fascinated by this, the idea that God would use mathematics uh, to create uh, the universe. So here's an example uh, in, the, in the original Latin of Newton's signature uh, in 1722 uh, in one of these autograph books. Uh, okay, so the theology of the Principia. I've already said uh, that the original edition of the Principia only has one reference to God and one reference to uh, the scriptures. So this is the first, the title page of the first edition of the Principia, famous, very famous book, of course, in the history of science. And this is the one reference to God, the top paragraph there, where Newton writes that God placed the planets at different distances from the sun so that according to the degrees of density, they may enjoy a greater or less proportion of the sun's heat. This today we would call the fine-tuning argument uh, for the existence of God, that the cosmos is so finely tuned uh, that it, it uh, speaks to uh, a creator. But in the second and third editions, he actually removes uh, the name God. Uh, I argue that he, God is still there in the passive tense of, of the verb. And this might seem curious, why would, God, why would Newton remove uh, the name God? Uh, but in fact, uh, he more than compensates for that with his general scolium, uh, which he publishes at the end of his second and third editions of Principia, uh, more than half of which is about God. This is a kind of an appendix. Newton also wrote some letters to the young Cambridge clergyman uh, Richard Bentley about his uh, thinking behind the Principia. He said, when I wrote my treatise about our system, I had an eye upon such principles as might work with considering men for the belief of a deity, and nothing can rejoice me more than to find it useful for that purpose. He's speaking about the Principia. For if I have done the public any service this way, it is due to nothing but industry and patient thought. So he gives some examples of what we would now call the design argument. Uh, so on the distinction between shining and opaque bodies in the heavens, he writes, I do not think this is explicable by mere natural causes, but I'm forced to ascribe it to the counsel and contrivance of a voluntary agent, by which, of course, he means God. Uh, to make this, another example, to make this system, therefore, with all its motions, required a cause which understood and compared together the quantities of matter in, and this is, again, this idea, God creating a number, weight, and measure, uh, the quantities of matter in the several bodies of the sun and planets and the gravitating powers resulting from thence, and to compare and adjust all these things together in so great a variety of bodies argues that cause to be not blind and fortuitous, but very well skilled in mechanics and geometry. Uh, then he writes the di diurnal or the daily rotations of the sun and planets as they could hardly arise from any cause purely mechanical, so by being determined all the same way with the annual and menstrual monthly motions, they seem to make up that harmony in the system which was the effect of choice rather than chance. And he's talking about chance 
he's probably thinking about Epicureanism, the ancient Greek philosophy, which argued that uh, the cosmos came together by the random swerve of atoms. Now, uh, I, I mentioned earlier this uh, quotation where he talks about God being very well uh, skilled in mechanics and geometry. Uh, there is a place uh, in the preface to the first edition uh, where he uses uh, the language of the most perfect mechanic of all. And probably, in light of that letter to Bentley, he's probably here alluding to God. So what this tells us is that even though there's only one reference to God in the first edition and one reference to the Bible, there's actually more going on there behind the scenes. Okay, uh, Newton made a distinction uh, between absolute and relative uh, time, <coughs> space, place, and motion. Uh, he wanted to argue there's a difference between absolute time, which uh, moves forward without slowing down or speeding up without any reference to anything external. Uh, same thing with uh, space, uh, place, and motion. Uh, and then he says this, accordingly those who here there interpret these words as referring to the quantities being measured do violence to the scriptures. And you think, why is he referring to the scriptures here? This is a philosophical statement about the difference between the absolute and relative in physics. And they no less corrupt mathematics and philosophy who confuse true quantities with their relations and common measures. So we know what he means now because we have access to his private manuscripts. And so from his private manuscripts we read this. Uh, it was necessary, moreover, carefully to distinguish absolute and relative quantities from one another because all phenomena depend on absolute quantities and yet the common people who do not know how to abstract their thoughts from their senses always speak of relative quantities to the point where it would be absurd for either wise men or even for the prophets, and he's referring to the Hebrew prophets here, uh, to speak otherwise among them. Whence both the scriptures and writings of theologians are always to be understood of relative quantities, he would be laboring with a gross prejudice who thence, that is to say, on the basis of these writings, stirred up disputations about the absolute, he first wrote, struck that out, replaced it with philosophical motions of natural things. So this is a much more expansive, much more detailed version of that more concise statement that is in the published text of all three editions of the Principia. And Newton's manuscripts are wonderful because they, they reveal in much more clarity and much more detail uh, his uh, thinking. So what is he saying here? He's saying if you read the Bible as if it uses mathematical, philosophical, absolute language, you're going to misread it because, and he, he has a sentence here which he crosses out, it's just as if someone should contend that the moon in the first chapter of Genesis was counted among the two greatest lights, not by its apparent, but by its absolute magnitude. Of course, the, the moon is not a light-giving body. It is a reflector. And Genesis chapter 1, the, the Genesis account of creation in day 4, it describes the greater light and the lesser light. And Newton is saying it's, the sun is the greater light and the moon is the lesser light from the perspective of those on the earth. But this is not astronomical language. Newton believed that there were other stars out there that were bigger and brighter uh, than the sun. So he's saying you need to understand that there's a distinction between the absolute and relative in order to understand scripture and in order to avoid misunderstanding scripture. So that distinction between the absolute and the relative applies both in his physics and in his understanding of the scriptures. Uh, so here's another, uh, a couple examples here which speak to this. He writes, the system of the heavenly bodies is not at all taught in scripture. Remember Galileo quoting guard, uh, Cardinal Baronius who said that the Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. So Newton's saying, don't read the Bible as if it's a physics textbook because you're gonna misunderstand it. So because of this, nothing stands in the way of the earth's moving around the sun according to the law of the planets. Objections from scripture removed. Objections against what? objections against the heliocentric view of the cosmos. The same argument Galileo is making. Yes, there are passages, Psalm 19 for example, that seem to describe the sun moving. But Galileo and Newton and others argued this is just the apparent motion. And even modern scientists talk about the sun rising and the sun setting. Uh, Adir, do you say the sun rises and sun sets? But of course you know that it's not astronomically correct. 
This is the language of common speech. And uh, there's actually a, uh, a Jewish statement uh, that the Bible is spoken in the language of the sons of men, that is to say, in the language of uh, human beings. Uh, so Newton is thinking along uh, those lines. He also wrote a very short manuscript uh, 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 shortly after the Principia uh, arguing uh, for uh, these points. Not published, uh, but published now online. Uh, so in the second edition of the Principia, uh, he adds uh, the general scolium. This is one of the uh, drafts of the general scolium. Uh, this is uh, the published version, the, the third edition from 1726. More than half of it is about theology, and it's natural theology, but it's also theology proper, and that, that is uh, interesting. So he writes a little bit about uh, the, the comets and the planets, and he says this most beautiful, and he uses the Latin elegantissima system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Please understand that this is now published. This is in the published public text. Yes, it's in Latin, but it's published in English in 1729, so fairly early uh, after, uh, soon after Newton's death. And if the fixed stars are the centers of other like systems, these being formed by the wise council, the likewise council must all be subject to the dominion of one. Newton was a, a very strict monotheist. He did not believe in the Trinity, as already mentioned, especially since the light of the fixed stars is of the same nature with the light of the sun, and from every system, uh, light passes into all other systems. This, my friends, is what we call the design argument. Unless the systems of the fixed stars should, by their gravity, fall on each other mutually, he hath placed those systems at immense distances from one another. And this, again, is the fine tuning argument, what we would call the fine tuning argument today. One of Newton's followers produced this uh, chart of the planetary and cometary uh, system. So when Newton is thinking about the beauty and the intricacy uh, of the system of the cosmos, he's thinking about this kind of uh, image. Now, uh, when we see an image like that, we might think of the myth, and I want to argue that it's a myth, that Newton believed in a clockwork universe, that God is a clockmaker and created the universe as a clock, wound it up, and then went on a holiday. Newton did not believe this, so one of his followers uh, said this, and this is exactly what Newton believed. The notion of the world's being a great machine going on without the interposition of God as a clock continues to go without the assistance of a clockmaker is the notion of materialism and fate and tends under pretense of making God a supramundane intelligence to exclude providence and God's government in reality out of the world. So what Clark is saying is that if you take this view that God is a clockmaker who designed the, the world, the universe as a clock, this is essentially deism or deism. The idea that there is a God, uh, but God just set up the universe and then took his hands off, uh, is not involved in intervening, uh, not involved in upholding the cosmos, is not intervening in human affairs, and certainly did not inspire uh, the Bible. Newton and his followers did not believe that, uh, so they're rejecting that clockwork uh, view. Now, Newton goes on in the general scolium to speak more particularly about God. He says, this being, God, governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all. And on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God Pantocrator. He uses the Greek there. It just means almighty ruler. In this translation, it's translated as universal ruler. For God is a relative word and has a respect to servants, and deity is the dominion of God, not over his own body, as those who fancy God to be the soul of the world. He's referring to the Greek idea of the anima mundi, uh, which he rejects, uh, but over uh, servants. Uh, and then he goes on to say that the supreme God is a being, eternal, infinite, absolutely perfect, but a being, however perfect, without dominion, cannot be said to be Lord God. For we say, my God, your God, the God of Israel, the God of gods, and Lord of lords. But we do not say, my eternal, your eternal, the eternal of Israel, the eternal of gods. We do not say, my infinite, or my perfect. Uh, very briefly, what Newton is saying here is that God is defined by relations or relationships. He is the God of someone. He is the God of Israel. Uh, he's the God of gods. He's the greatest God. He's the only God is the implication there. So he wants to avoid philosophical um, definitions of God 
and to think more in terms of God in uh, relations and uh, relationships. Uh, but this idea of the relative, we've already encountered that in his uh, physics. These are titles, he says, which have no respect to servants. He says the word God, Deus, usually signifies Lord. If we use the word Lord, we immediately think you have to be Lord of something. You can't just be Lord. You have to be Lord of something. So he, he thinks that God is, has that sense. But every Lord is not a God. It is the dominion of a spiritual being which constitutes a God. If God does not have dominion and sovereignty and providence, then he's not a true God. He has a very powerful view of God's dominion. And then you can see uh, that he says a few things about uh, God, and he actually quotes from the Bible. So here, I argue, he kind of breaks his rule that uh, pr theology proper should not uh, be mixed with uh, natural philosophy. And what he's saying is that uh, in, in, the, in the book of Exodus, uh, Moses is called a god to his brother uh, Aaron. Uh, in Psalm 82, it, it talks about the Hebrew judges as being Elohim, as being gods. Uh, and so Newton is saying, this doesn't make them God in a substantial uh, sense. They're not the God of uh, the universe, uh, but rather uh, in a relative sense. They're, they're mighty Elohim, the root meaning uh, being might and, and power. But there's something else going on here because there are a few times in uh, the New Testament uh, where uh, Jesus is called God. It's very few, four or five, uh, depending on which ones you count. And Newton did not believe that Jesus was God in the same sense as the Father. So there's a little bit of a anti-Trinitarian argument creeping in here. It's not explicit, but we know it's there because we have access to the manuscripts. We look back at the Principia uh, and other aspects of it, including this language of from infinity to infinity, and uh, we can see uh, him using it in the general scolium, and the language comes from the book of Psalms, that God is uh, from everlasting to everlasting, Psalm uh, 90. Now, uh, this is a, a word cloud of the first Latin edition of the general uh, uh, scolium. And you can see deus is the uh, most common word. That's the Latin word for God. This is the second edition. Uh, it's even bigger. And now we have it in English. Uh, you can see the focus of the general scolium uh, is uh, on God as well as these other terms. You see sun, uh, planets, etc. Okay, so uh, he makes a, a statement in the general scolium. Um, and I'm just going to skip to the version that's in the published text. Yeah, uh, and thus much concerning God to discourse about, uh, discourse about whom from the appearances of things certainly does pertain to experimental philosophy. So here he's saying, yes, you can use experimental philosophy in the second edition of the general scolium. He changes it to natural philosophy. There's an even broader, um, a broader concept. Um, so to, when you study science, it's permissible to talk about God. He's thinking generally in terms of uh, natural uh, theology. Okay, I'll just say a couple things about the optics and then uh, I'll be uh, done. So as I said, the first edition of the optics, no explicit references at all to theology. Remember though, that there was a draft preface that does have references to theology. He doesn't use it, uh, but it's certainly part of his uh, thinking. But in the first Latin edition, which comes out only two years after the first English edition, English edition 1704, Latin edition 1706. Uh, he does actually bring in uh, the design argument uh, as we see here in the query that is eventually called uh, query 31. Uh, he talks about uh, an intelligent agent, uh, e e et cetera. And uh, here he talks about uh, the need for God to bring in um, his influence uh, when uh, the system of comets and planets uh, runs down. God is going to intervene, use comets and, and obviously Newtonian physics, gravity, uh, to bring the system back into alignment. And he talks about this as a reformation. And that clearly, this is in English, the English text, uh, that clearly has religious or theological resonances. You think about a religious uh, reformation. Um, then he also talks about uh, the structure of animal bodies. Uh, uh, in, the, in the optics, and we see him doing the same thing in Cain's Manuscript 7, one of his private manuscripts. Again, we use the private manuscripts to interpret uh, the published text. So he's thinking along the lines of the design argument. 
And then there is this, which we've already looked at, the idea that uh, a good science is going to have an ethical center and it's also going to be related to our understanding and our relationship uh, to God. And it's interesting that he alludes uh, at the end to the seven precepts of the sons of Noah, Noachism. And uh, in a, a personal copy of the optics, he actually writes them out. Uh, here we see them here. So he's picking this up uh, from his study of uh, Christian uh, Hebraeus. So my final point uh, is that there's a relationship between his cosmology and his understanding of uh, prophecy. So this is a manuscript from the uh, National Library of Israel in, in Jerusalem. It's an apocalyptic time chart. Time moves from the top to the bottom. All the events of the time of the end uh, occur at the bottom. Uh, he believed that the true gospel, that is to say original Christianity, would be preached at the time of the end and Babylon would fall. And Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church, yes, but probably more largely the entire uh, Trinitarian Church. And there would be a pure religion and that religion would be like the religion of Noah and his sons. It would be monotheistic, it would be against idolatry. Dr. Pridor has mentioned this. Newton hated idolatry. He hated idolatry in religion and he hated idolatry in science uh, as well. And so uh, we see this uh, idea that God intervenes in uh, religious affairs and human affairs uh, to bring about reformations. He sends the prophets uh, the Old Testament or Hebrew prophets uh, and also in the New Testament to correct uh, his people when they turn away from the true religion. He does the same uh, with uh, the cosmos. So there's a structural similarity between his religious ideas and his science and that is my final point. So, so Newton believed that you could say the eternal God, God is eternal because eternal is an adjective. It describes who God is. But he doesn't like saying that God is the eternal. That's too vague. That's too deistic. Uh, uh, Dr. Pridor is going to give a talk about Newton's Hebrew, and I think he will agree with what you just said, that his, his Hebrew was not perfect. That's true, yeah. When it's going to happen, mm -hmm. how it's going to happen. Can you start to say something mm -hmm. about it? Can you elaborate on that? Uh, so, Newton dies in 1727. Uh, he believed that uh, the big events, and this would include uh, the, re the Jewish restoration to, to Israel, uh, the, um, the, uh, the Battle of Armageddon, the invasion of Gog and Magog described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, all of those events would happen two to three hundred years after his lifetime. And this is interesting because many uh, prophetic interpreters in, in his own lifetime were, were arguing that uh, the events would happen in the 17th and 18th uh, century. And this is actually typical. You see this today where people make predictions where they say that, you know, uh, the rapture, this is a Christian concept, the rapture is going to happen you know, in 2012 or 2013, and then of course it doesn't happen. So Newton says, those people who do that, they bring uh, the Bible and ultimately God into disrepute uh, because it makes it look like the Bible uh, is failed. But Newton is saying, it's not the Bible that fails, it's the interpreters that fail. So Newton says we, t we should take a much more cautious approach. And so he does speculate on some dates and that sort of thing, but he never does it in public. 
He believes that that's uh, very dangerous. Uh, he just writes in his private manuscript. Now, we know about them today because we've read the manuscripts and they're, they're published online. And I think maybe Newton might be a little, might be a little bit nervous about that if he knew that his uh, private thoughts were, were being released. But he was very adamant about that, that, uh, that prophetic interpreters were not prophets. He said that. Uh, prophecy is designed to bring glory to God, not to humans. Well, one example would be his understanding of God's omnipresence and his understanding of universal gravitation. Uh, so this is one, it's a little bit different than what you've just said, but it's one area where we can see that there seems to be a link. So Newton believes that only two things are everywhere, absolutely everywhere. What are they? God's omnipresence and gravity. And so he believes that they're somehow connected, but he, I want to stress that he was not like Spinoza. He, he was not a pantheist. He's a theist. He believes that there is a God. The cosmos is, is not God. The cosmos is matter. Uh, but he does believe in, in God's omnipresence. This is not a radical idea. It's a very common idea. Uh, but it's one area where we can see that his thinking about God um, helps, I think, make it easier for him to accept universal gravitation. The, the ideas are, are conceptually related to, for him. Thank you very much.